Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, we are here back in this Friday to continue with the Solenasi seminars. So today I will be presenting Luke Wheeler, Lucas Wheeler actually. Uh, he's a biochemist. Um, he, has, he earned his undergrad, undergraduate degree in biochemistry from Montana State University, where he worked on engineering biometric and nanomaterials based on viral capsids. And then he continued his PhD in biochemistry also at, at the University of Oregon, studying the evolutionary biochemistry of the, one, the S100 proteins uh, with Dr. Mike Hans. And, and finally, he continued now with his postdoctoral research at the Smith lab, working well with Stacy Smith. And he joined in 2018 we're working to prove the genetic molecular and biochemical underpinnings of the red flower color and also the flower color evolution in Solanaceae, especially working on the petunia clade and also in Iochroma. So welcome, uh, Luke. We are very excited about your, your talk about your flower color evolution. Um, so now you can share your screen. Um, start when, when you're ready. All right. <clears throat> thanks, Rocio, and uh, yeah, thanks for to the organizers for inviting me. This is a fun opportunity. Let me uh, get my screen share working. All right, is that still you can see that, Rocio? Yes, that's perfect. Okay, cool. <laughs> Yeah, so like Rocia said, I'm Luke Wheeler, and I work with Stacy Smith, and I'm going to try to sort of talk about three different projects here that I'm working on and relate them and under this umbrella of a sort of integrative approach to studying the evolution of floral pigmentation. So I'm going to jump into it. So our work in the Smith lab focuses on understanding the evolution of, of flower color. So here I'm showing three different uh, species of uh, flowers flowering plants from the, the petunia clade of Solanaceae, and in each one I'm highlighted a different uh, pigment that's being produced that's giving rise to the color. So you have on the left uh, delphinidin, which is a, tends to be bluish. In the middle is cyanidin, which is a sort of magenta color, and on the red is pelargonidin, which uh, tends to be red or red-orange. And um, you can see that I've zoomed in, and the insets show these pigments concentrated uh, in the petal cells of of the flower. So those are just little strips I've taken off of the flowers and taken microscopy photos there. So these pigments are produced by the anthocyanin pigmentation pathway. Uh, this is part of the flavonoid pathway that also produces uh, flavanols and there's flavones as well. Um, you can see here this is sort of the core pathway structure that I've presented. So the gray at the top is just some upstream uh, material that flows into the pathway and um, it flows through the pathway. Each of these arrows is a reaction catalyzed by an enzyme, and each of these circles is a pool of uh, substrate or product, a chemical species that's, that's being produced or used in the pathway. So the pigments themselves are these things, these sort of three ringed uh, structures, and the main difference really between them is that the, uh, the number of these hydroxyl OH groups that are present on this aromatic ring and that changes the electronic properties of the ring and changes the absorbance. So by adding these, you get different absorbance spectra and different colors. So, um, <clears throat> so like I said, there's, um, there's these, the, the pigments that are being produced that are associated with the color. And uh, these other things, the, the camphorol, quercetin, and uh, mericetin are the flavanols, which I'll also mention later. And I'm just gonna stop and take a moment to also point out, I'll be talking a lot about these branching enzymes, F3 prime H, F3 prime 5 prime H, and this one DFR that is involved in several different pathway reactions. And I will talk more about those as we go on. Um, so while the general sort of structure of the pathway and the, end of the enzyme components are well known and they're pretty conserved across a lot of different, uh, a lot of different uh, plant families, the, um, regulatory architecture is a bit less well understood. So there are things that we know in general about it. For example, that these MIB transcription factors are 
uh, important for controlling the regulation of pathway genes, and that there sort of tends to be broken up into upstream or early genes and downstream later genes in the pathway, where these upstream genes are controlled by R2, R3, MIBs, and uh, a complex formed by three types of transcription factors is controlling these things in blue. But from what has been observed, it, there's a lot of variation in the, gen the regulatory architecture that controls the pathway enzyme expression. And um, there's also these MIBs, for example, evolve quickly and they're duplicating a lot. And in some species, there are like a couple hundred of them. So there's a, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for change in the regulatory architecture. And sometimes these, uh, these can actually become tissue specific regulatory factors as well. So for example, I can turn on a gene in the flowers only to the exclusion of, of affecting it in the vegetative tissue, that kind of, uh, that kind of circuitry. So um, I'm gonna sort of walk through three, the interconnected vignettes. And these are three different projects I'm working on with the goal of sort of trying to understand fundamental questions and fundamental molecular processes that are going on during the evolution of the anthocyanin pathway. So first I'm gonna tell you about some work, and this is a purely theoretical computational uh, modeling projects that are focused on understanding what we should expect to see from the pathway evolving between different phenotypes. The second is um, the, we're, we're using a phylotranscriptomic approach to infer the phylogeny of the petunia clade of solanaceae and also to collect data that we can use to directly look at the molecular underpinnings of flower color transitions. And third is a more detailed dissection of, of a single flower color transition in the genus Iachroma, also solanaceae, and uh, and, and this is something that actually goes back to Stacy's uh, graduate and postdoctoral work. So it's, a, it's a sort of a long thread of research. So first we'll start with this, the computational modeling of the pathway. And let me try to justify why we're interested in doing this by uh, bringing up this, uh, this idea of genetic hotspots in evolution. So in phenotypes that are determined by metabolic or signaling pathways, it has often been observed that there are certain pathway loci such as these ones that I've highlighted in yellow here, that are often the, the repeated targets of evolution. So if you, if you have a phenotypic transition in the phenotype determined by this pathway, you'll often see that the same genes are getting hit with mutations or uh, regulatory changes. And so there's kind of two reasons that, two main reasons this can be the case. One is thought to be the idea that the cer certain genes are better at avoiding the, uh, the antagonistic pleiotropy that might arise from, say, uh, restraints on other phenotypes that are also affected by the pathway. So if I do something bad to a, another necessary phenotype, that's going to make that mutation unfavorable. And so that's one reason that this can happen. The other is that there, there might be intrinsic things about the, these genes and the structure of their position in the pathway that affects how well they are able to actually control the phenotype. And you can actually kind of see just from looking at these two pictures, for example, that these ones that are highlighted are, are sort of central hubs in a pathway, and maybe that has something to do with the reason that they're so often targeted. So it turns out the anthocyanin pathway is actually a good model for this as well. Um, so this is a complex phenotype determined by many different genes that make up the pathway. and um, there are in fact, in the empirical transitions that have been studied at the, at the genetic level, there are several hotspots that tend to get hit. So these are again, these uh, F3 prime H, F3 prime 5 prime H, and the DFR enzyme. And these have been seen to make up over about 95% of empirical transitions that have been characterized where we actually know the genetic basis. So this seemed like a good opportunity to ask, why is that? Is it something about the inherent structure of the pathway that makes these favorable? And that is certainly not something we've just come up with that's been hypothesized a lot and suggested that there are, for example, these enzymes occur at branches and it's logical to see that, you know, maybe if you were to do something to F3 prime 5 prime H, you would effectively clip off this branch and allow the material flowing through the pathway to be redirected, redirected down other branches. So we wanted to actually simulate this and study directly what is happening at these individual enzymes during pathway evolution between two sort of well-defined 
uh, color phenotypes. And uh, let me just say that first, so I, this uh, paper here from 2019, we did this with this sort of a naive model, which I'll explain a bit more in a second. Uh, we evolved between the, uh, a, red, a reddish state and a blue state, and we did recover in general these, the, almost the same sort of distribution of, uh, of mutations, these hotspots. So we wanted to understand why, what's going on there, and also how does the evolutionary context, so how does your starting state and your ending state and uh, what's being selected on, how does that actually affect the behavior of the hotspots? And also, uh, can, is there something about the, the, the pathway structure um, that, that determines the type and the direction and the order of mutations in evolutionary trajectories between flower color phenotypes um, that is also, it can that, is, how, does that, how does that interact with the evolutionary context as well? So do we see the same types of behaviors if we're going from blue to red or if we're going from purple to red or, or purple to, to, to blue, that sort of thing? So what we did is to pick a set of transitions that are commonly seen in nature. Um, so again, we started with this pathway I call the naive pathway. And essentially this is just kind of a null state. So it's a, it's a pathway where all of the kinetic parameters and enzyme concentrations are all basically set to be equal. So it's sort of unbiased by the, by the rates of the reactions. Um, and just because of the pathway structure itself, because the red branch comes off first, it gets a large share of the flux. This naive pathway is actually biased towards the production of the red pelargonidin, uh, pelargonidin pigment. So what we then did is, is evolve this 10,000 times uh, in parallel from this state to a blue state where 90% of the pigment composition is delphinidin, and then proceeded from that state to a purple cyanidin state and a red pelargonidin state. So this gives us a long sort of one continuous axis we have. Um, we have these, these sequential transitions, and each of these arrows is composed of actually 10,000 unique iterations. And the way that this generally works is that I have described the entire pathway as a, as a set of couple differential equations. Um, just describing the rates at which one uh, chemical species is converted to another by an enzyme. For example, here, DFR is present at some concentration, uh, and it has this Km, which is effectively sort of like a binding, a, a dissociation constant, and a Kcat, which is a catalytic turnover rate for the conversion of this THM to LCD. And uh, for an enzyme like DFR, which is involved in several reactions in the pathway, it will have different parameters for each one, for each, uh, re for each reaction and each substrate and product. And these uh, parameters are what is, this is the evolvable stuff of my pathway model. So there's no genetics really, it's, it's like a purely biochemical system um, that you could project back onto genetics, but there's no, there's no intrinsic uh, genetic modeling going on here. So what we do is just draw a random parameter, give it a random kick, recalculate uh, the steady state concentrations of things, and then based on how far that is from some optimal configuration, uh, we have a fitness a selection coefficient and we calculate um, a fixation probability and let it just sort of stochastically wander its way between two phenotypic states. And so this actually works really well. It took me quite a while to get this, get this whole framework Built, but now I've got it where it, 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 it can kind of plug and chug with these different simulations. And so here I'm going to mainly focus on the transition from, from blue to purple and purple to red. And you can see, for example, on the left in the blue to purple transition, you start out at high blue, you lose the blue delphinidin as you gain the, the, uh, the pink magenta cyanidin and a similar thing is going on in the transition from the cyanidin to the pelargonidin state. So if we go back to the questions that we wanted to ask, which are sort of what is the interplay between the structure, the inherent biases that are determined by the structure of the pathway and uh, the evolutionary context. And by that, I mean, are you going from blue to purple or are you going from purple to red? So these are sort of a different starting and ending states. And we wanted to see how, that, how those two things sort of shape the composition of the evolutionary trajectories. So what I'll first show you is that what we see is that the, this evolutionary context actually affects the fixation frequencies 
of mutations at the hotspot loci. So I'm going to focus here on uh, F3 prime H and F3 prime 5 prime H because these are where you really see a, a flip. So in the blue to purple transition, you see that the mutations at uh, F3 prime H are, are much less common than they are in the purple to red transition. And uh, the, the reverse is true in the, the F3 prime 5 prime H uh, gene enzyme. And so, uh, so this, is, this is showing clearly that, that you, while the, the same sort of set of hotspots are still being hit, the actual quantitative uh, properties of the of mutations being fixed there are different. And the type of mutation as well uh, is, is something we looked at. So the orange here are biochemical mutations. So these are changes to the catalytic rate and the binding constant the regulatory mutations are changes to the concentration. And you see that both are actually highly represented across all the simulations. There's a general bias towards regulatory mutations, but a lot of biochemical uh, mutations are happening and getting fixed as well. If we then look at the direction of the mutations, so what, what, uh, what sort of direction are, is it going in? Is it, is it improving the parameter, increasing it or decreasing it? And we see again that depending on where you're going, even though you're hitting the same, same genes, you're actually uh, hitting them in a different way. So this is looking at enzyme concentrations for uh, the, the, these four hotspots. And if you look again at F3 prime H and F3 prime 5 prime H, you see that there's a reverse pattern uh, between the purple, the blue to purple and the purple to red transition. So in uh, purple to blue to purple, for example, where we tend to increase the F3 prime H concentration, you see the opposite effect in the purple to red where it's tending to be decreased. Um, sorry. So this, this really strongly showing that there's, there's this, uh, this contingency of the behavior at hotspot loci depending on where you're starting and where you're, you're going to. And one more thing I'd like to point out is if you remember I showed uh, that there were sort of three predominant hotspots present in empirical transitions. There's only one, one known empirical transition I can think of that I've read about where uh, FLS has been involved, but you see that it's relatively highly represented. There's quite a few FLS events, and this is a, 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 the, the enzyme responsible for producing the flavanols. We think that the reason that this probably isn't showing up in, in, in nature is that um, this may be one of the instances I mentioned where there's a pleiotropic constraint. So the, the flavanols are actually super important for other things. They behave as sunscreens, for example, in tissues. And so anything that's, that's changing their concentration might, it might be faced with antagonistic pleiotropic constraints. So we next looked at the order of mutations that are fixed in trajectories, and we found that, they're, that they are somewhat predictable. They're, they're biased by uh, the, they're, they're biased across different parameters of the enzymes. So if you go back and you, you see that there are these uh, catalytic turnover rates, the binding constants and the enzyme concentrations, these are the parameters that are listed here. These are parameters that are making up at least 1% of all fixed mutations. And you can clearly see that sort of at the top that they're, the distributions uh, are more biased towards early trajectory steps. So across the bottom here, you have trajectory steps one through 10 and the darkness of the individual squares in the heat map are just the number of times you see a mutation at that parameter fixed at that step. And so certain things are biased more towards early mutations, whereas others are biased towards later in the trajectories. And the cool thing is that this is actually appears to be uh, determined by the average or the distribution of <clears throat> a fitness effects that you get from a parameter mutation at this parameter. So this, what I'm showing here, this S over delta is a selection coefficient over the actual just parameter effect size. So how much did I change the parameter? And you see that these ones that are highlighted in yellow are um, First of all, they're fixed more frequently. They also have much higher sensitivity. So you're getting more fitness change out of them for any given parameter value shift. And they're biased towards earlier things. 
And this holds across uh, both the blue to purple and the purple to red transitions. Um, but the, the, the really interesting thing is that these are also depend on the context. So if you're going from blue to purple, you have some set of mutations with some set of uh, average fitness effects. And those actually shift quite a bit when you're going from purple to red. So this is showing us that the, the fitness landscape itself is different depending on the starting and the ending state. And it's actually, it's actually shifting as you evolve the pathway. And so these, these uh, set, although the, the sort of overall effect is the same, that the things with big effects are going earlier, those, those identities are changing depending on, uh, on the context. And furthermore, um, it's interesting if you see that there are actually quite a few fewer uh, parameters in the purple to red transition. The reason for that is that basically everything making up the blue branch here has been effectively clipped off during the blue to purple transition. So we've essentially nullified that branch and don't have to worry about it anymore. Now we're worried about changing the, uh, the flux between of material and shifting it from production of purple to production of red uh, pelargonid and pigment. All right, so that sort of sets the stage for the types of things we expect to see based just purely on a theoretical model and, and the, the, the evolutionary context, so the phenotypic transition, where you start, where you end, as well as the uh, inherent uh, pathway structure, so biases that are determined by where in the pathway these, these enzymes are. So now I'm gonna now I'm gonna sh to shift and talk about our start talking about these two projects that are in experimental work. Um, first, I'm gonna tell you about the phylogenetic project in the Petunia clade of Solanaceae, and I'm gonna try to to tie this back uh, throughout to these to these ideas of uh, that we deter that we've that we've come across from the simulations. So the Petuni are, are a fairly large clade that ranges uh, from southern South America to southern North America, um, showing just sort of a distribution of, of observations on iNaturalist here. And on, on the right is the, uh, the Cali Bracoa clade. You've probably seen these. They're very uh, nice colors. They're often used in uh, hanging baskets or that sort of thing. And uh, they're, they're, they're present in uh, Argentina and Brazil. The species in the petunia occupy a wide range of different habitats. So places like these, these, these really cool tropical highlands, marshlands, uh, wet Atlantic forests. Some, uh, some species have actually adapted to these sort of extreme desert environments. So for example, this one is up at 4,500 meters. So that's like 14,500 feet. This is this high desert in, uh, in Northwestern Argentina. And uh, so you can really see that there's a lot of different, very variable places that these things live. And as you might expect from knowing that, there's a lot of different forms, different growth forms. So things that are basically like cushions and shrubs, little herbs, and um, even things that are sort of becoming like a tree, a fairly tall, woody, tree-like shrubs. And for our purposes, the really interesting thing is that there's actually a lot of variation in flower color and flower uh, morphology. And you can see across the top here, each of these is a, uh, pictures is a different species and there's quite a range from uh, you know, pure white to, uh, to yellow, purple, bluish purple, reds and pinks and magentas. And there's also quite a lot of variation in flower shape, size, and also uh, color patterning. So, so this, this, we, what, this seems like a great system to be able to actually study transitions between flower colors in nature. So we really need more of those to be able to see if the predictions we get from our models are really consistent with nature. Because these, these experiments to, to identify the genetic basis for flower color transitions are hard. They take a long time. You need a lot. It's a, it's a lot of work. So there really aren't that many. There aren't enough to really get comparable statistics that we can then compare with our model predictions. So this is a pretty big clade and, and with a lot of flower color transitions. And so we're hoping 
that we can use it as a, as a template to be able to go and look at the molecular mechanisms underlying these transitions. But one sort of main problem here is that the relationships within the petunia clade have, have remained fairly ambiguous uh, in, to, in phylogenetic analyses. Um, so for example, this is the, uh, the Fabianas, which are those desert dwelling shrubs that I showed you. Uh, just based on morphological assessments, they have often been grouped outside of uh, the Petunia and Calibracoa, which are thought to be sister to one another. But in some molecular phylogenetic analyses, this relationship is flipped, where Petunia actually is outside of the sister group of Fabiana and Calibracoa. So this is just an example of one of the sort of ambiguous relationships that we were hoping to, to fix. So what we set out to do is to build a phylogeny, and this will allow us to have a framework to study these different interesting things that are going on. So biogeography, pollination systems, and of course, I'm focusing primarily on uh, flower color here. So I just wanna take a brief aside to say thanks to everybody who's worked on this. So this, of course, is not all me doing all of this. In fact, I came into this project after it had already uh, been started and Julianne and Stacy and uh, Amy were already working on it. Um, and I, I've come in and I've done several field trips and it's just been a very collaborative and internationally collaborative project. And so I just wanted to make sure everybody's aware of that and say thanks to everyone um, and everybody who's been uh, great uh, field trip buddies as well. So the basic idea of what we're doing here is to go out in the field and primarily these are samples collected in the field, although some are from our greenhouse specimens as well. And we find a population of, of a wild uh, population of these petunia species, whichever ones we're looking for. And we, we find, uh, we collect floral buds at a certain stage from uh, three to four individuals per species. We extract uh, the RNA, and then I've gone through and prepared uh, RNA sequencing libraries for each of these uh, individuals separately barcoded. Actually, I'm still working on completely finishing this data set. Um, sequence them, and then we have a custom uh, pipeline we've put together that we can use to assemble uh, transcriptomes, de novo transcriptomes for each species. Then we're using these, uh, these data, these transcriptome data, in a phylotranscriptomic context to reconstruct the phylogeny. And that part is done by uh, Joe Walker, who's at Cambridge with uh, Ed Weege, and he has put together sort of a novel approach to construct the phylogeny where he starts with a first pass of a hierarchical clustering of the transcripts from, from our de novo assemblies. He then extracts orthologs in a unique way by looking at the inferred duplications in the, in the petunia in-group, and then uses those to resolve a species tree with two different approaches so we can sort of compare and contrast a, a coalescent method and a supermatrix method. And the really cool about this thing, the cool, cool thing about this is uh, we actually ended up with over 3,900 orthologs that are represented in at least 60 of the 69 species that we have here. So we have a lot of, a lot of low side to work with to, to infer the tree. And in doing so, we, do, we get a really well resolved phylogeny for the most part. So some of the internal relationships within genera are a little am, are ambiguous, but the relationships between genera are actually, um, are, are, mostly quite well supported. So everywhere here that doesn't, that isn't labeled is greater than uh, 0.95 posterior probability. So now that we have this tree, um, oh yeah, sorry, let me uh, say, so just uh, as an example, going back to this, this, uh, this uh, relationship that I brought up before, the Fabiana and the Calibracoa and the Petunia, we actually find strong support for the sister relationship between Fabiana, the desert shrubs, and Calibracoa, which are these little herby, creeping herb things. And Petunia is actually outside of those two. So despite the morphological similarities between Petunia and Calibracoa, we have strong support that actually this relationship that has popped up a few times is, is probably the correct one. And there are some hints even at the, at the morphological level. So for example, the flower color patterning is, can be quite similar along the corolla tube between Calibracoa and Fabiana, and that's essentially absent in, in wild petunia species. So this is just to say we now have a good phylogeny to work with, and we can go and we can use it as a framework to study floral pigmentation shifts. Um, so 
you know, there's a lot of known and interesting transitions in Petunia and Calibrachoa, and some of those have been studied at the molecular level, but there's a, there's a lot of other interesting things going on in this clade too. So for example, if you focus on this group containing a leptoglossus, a Mirambergia, Clamania, Buschettia, and Hunzicaria, there have been interesting flower color transitions here as well. So for example, uh, white flowers, transitions from pink to white or pink to red. And so this is the type of thing that we can now use our data to go and look at the molecular mechanisms. And when I say look at the molecular mechanisms, what I mean is that we, because we have individual replicates from each species, we can get, uh, we can actually do transcriptomic uh, like uh, expression analyses. And for every single individual, we also have paired reflectance spectroscopy data, which is a quantitative measure of the flower color. And we have uh, pigment composition data from uh, chromatography. So we can actually say, what pigments is this making? What color is it? And what genes are being expressed? And so right now I'm trying to finish this data set and, and Amy has been working hard on finishing the pigment chromatography data set. We're gonna put this all together and try to have a quantitative model that relates gene expression in the pathway to the actual color and pigment output. And by doing this, we can, we can find relationships between gene expression and pigment production. We can find relationships uh, between the expression of genes. So for example, we can find co-expression model modules and uh, we can then use these to further parameterize the models that I, that I presented you originally and to test the predictions of those models. So we can look and say, okay, here we have a transition from pink to red. Do we see what we would expect based on theoretical expectations from our model? Okay, now transitioning again to my uh, third vignette here. This is a project I've started working on more recently, but this actually stems all the way back to Stacy's uh, Stacy's graduate and postdoctoral work in particular. And this is actually an effort to look at the molecular basis of a specific flower color transition in the Iachroma genus, which is also in a Solanaceae. So on the left here, I have this blue purple flowered Iachroma cyneum, and on the right is a Iachroma gesnerioides, which is, you can see is red. And so at some point in uh, the past, there was a transition to this red color. And there are actually two species that are red. Gisnerioides is shown here, and the Isenium is shown here as blue. Um, and the ancestor of this red clade was a blue flowered species as well. So the transition went from blue to red, and that is the thing that we're interested in. So Stacy, during her postdoc, um, worked on this by doing a, uh, uh, doing a crossing experiment where she crossed Igesnerioides with Isineum, and then she was able to infer genes that were involved in this transition by looking at pathway loci. So what she found was sort of three main contributing changes that happened. The first is this F3'H branching enzyme that directs flux from upstream towards the cyanidin and the delphinidin branches. So this was strongly downregulated in the red Igesnerioides. The, there was a second change, which was the uh, deletion of a functional F3'5'H copy from Igesnerioides. So you can see that we're sort of clipping off the branches by clipping off F3'5'H and clipping off F3'H, you're redirecting flux towards the red pelargonidin. And the final thing that she observed was that there were uh, uh, mutations in the active site of the DFR enzyme that changed the specificity on precursors. So for example, making it more efficient at producing the uh, flux down the red branch and less efficient at moving material down the blue branch. So these are pretty uh, cut and dry. We kind of understand this is a, a functional change caused by a deletion of the gene. This was a functional change caused by amino acid substitutions. But this change in the expression of F3'H we don't know what's actually causing that. But what Stacy was able to infer is that this is caused by a single transacting factor and not cis-regulatory changes. So with that in mind, we hypothesize that this factor is likely to be one of these transcription factors, probably an R2, 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 R3 MIB, which I, which I told you about before, as these tend to regulate these downstream enzymes in, in conjunction with these BHLH and WD40 transcription factors 
that uh, form a complex together. So Stacy dubbed this transacting locus the T locus and was able to infer uh, individuals that had a, this, this genotype, even though we don't know what that genotype actually is. So the design of what I've been working on is to take uh, the, what Stacy did is to cross the, the red and the blue species and then back cross to a red, the red species to get a distribution of, of genotypes that are shown here. So you have eight different unique things. You have homozygotes for red uh, T locus, whatever that is, F3 prime, 5 prime H and the DFR. And because we had individuals with these known states and known uh, pigment concentrations, we were able to actually then individually barcode and sequence three replicates for each of these inferred uh, or known gene types. And then I'm just gonna take an aside to say, Stacy and her graduate student, Dan, ha had done something similar to this. Um, they did a bulk segregant analysis, so where the, that's not broken up by individuals, and uh, were able to infer a, uh, the activity of a MIB that regulates um, a blue to white transition in another uh, in another iachroma species. The uh, this has also been used in the Yuan group uh, to identify another MIB involved in flower traits. So this this can work. Uh, the uh, the sort of only real innovation we have here is that we actually know, we actually know these individual inferred genotypes and we have sequenced them individually. So we have. It's a lot. It's cleaner in that sense than a than a bulk segregant analysis where you're working with pools of, from phenotypes. So I put together sort of hacked together uh, association mapping pipeline here, and this is all stuff I've been doing really recently. Um, so I clean up the raw reads that we have, align them to the parental transcriptomes. So I have re we have we have data from the parental species from a couple other projects. So I reassembled transcriptomes for those, align the reads to them, and then use uh, some tools to call uh, variants, so indels or SNPs, and quality filter them. And then I've put together an association pipeline that just, that essentially just asks, are there variants that perfectly match the expected, expected segregation pattern of the T locus? So we, we should have, if we break it up just along the T locus dimension, we should have 12 individuals that have a uh, that have this homozygous red state and 12 that have this other state. And so I applied this to our data and found, first of all, that uh, let me just say that was able to recapitulate some of the known changes. So there is this in the red species, this same observed strong down regulation of F3 prime H. And we also see that uh, variants at the F3 prime 5 prime H are uh, perfectly segregate with its known genotype. So when I then apply this, this pipeline sort of agnostically to the whole data set, I get a relatively small number of things that appear to be associated, and almost all of them map to this narrow region uh, on the tomato genome. And the reason I'm using the tomato genome is because it's actually a well annotated genome, and um, so it can sort of look and see where things are going at the chromosome level. And one of these hits that is a SNP that is perfectly associated with the expected segregating pattern of the T locus is a MIB transcription factor, this one here. So this is this MIB is actually, it's not an R2 or R3 MIB. It's a most closely related, or just based on BLAST, it seems to be most similar to this MIB called Devericata, which is involved in flower symmetry, uh, the control of flower symmetry during development. And I, my pipeline may be too strict, but I was only able to identify one SNP that's per, that, that, that is in this gene that is associated with the transition, and that is one that causes a histidine to uh, glutamine amino acid substitution. So what I did here, this model, I used a, a modeling approach to make a homology model. So using another plant MIB as a template, I took this sequence from our transcriptome and made a, a estimate of the 3D model. And you can see this, this mutation is actually over here sticking out from the, the helix that fits into the DNA uh, where, where it finds DNA. So it's not clear to me exactly what this might be doing. If, if anything, it, it, uh, if this is a real signal, this could potentially interfere with the binding to another protein or it could change the dynamics or it could change the stability or the structure and interfere with DNA binding. It's, um, it's not clear. This is all extremely preliminary, but I was pretty excited about this when I came across this 
within the last few days, so I thought I had to talk about it. Um, I also checked to see, does it look like there's a difference in the expression level of this thing between the red and the blue sets? It doesn't, it doesn't really look like it. But the interesting thing about Divericata is that it is known to interact with other MIBs, and it actually has been shown to affect the expression in some species where it has been studied of R2, R3 MIBs. So I thought, well, maybe what's going on is this is a change that's somehow affecting its DNA binding or something, and that is potentially affecting another MIB. So I did just sort of an agnostic differential expression analysis comparing the red and the blue groups where we have 12 individuals, I'll remind you in each of these groups. And first I was able to again recapitulate that there is this highly significant and large decrease in the red expression of F3 prime H. The interesting thing is you see a very similar pattern at another MIB. So this is something that I have listed here, uh, th MIB 3, 6, 8, 12, like it's hard to tell it's hard to tell what it is just by blasting, and I think we'll need to do some sort of phylogenetic analysis if this turns out to be a real thing to figure out what it's actually related to. But it's clearly an R2, R3 MIB that is highly downregulated, about to the same extent as F3 prime H is in uh, the red group. So that kind of, with all of this preliminary data, if we assume that maybe there's, this is actually a real signal, something's going on here, it sort of presents the possibility of two models for what might be happening, which is, uh, for example, that the, um, this mutation that we've observed that's associated with the red uh, pool affects this Divericata-like MIB, which otherwise would drive expression of this new MIB, and that would affect expression of F3 prime H. Or, for example, this could actually uh, this could actually allow Divericata to interfere with expression of a MIB that's normally driving F3 prime H. Um, and I, I should say that, the, that those MIBs that I said this is similar to have all been shown to be involved in the regulation of anthocyanin genes in some species. So, so that, that I think that this is, this is probably at least hinting at something real that might be going on here. Of course, there may be other models and uh, the main reason that I'm showing you all this, this is because I would really like to actually get feedback. And if anybody has any thoughts or thinks I missed something or thinks it's all nonsense or has an interesting uh, suggestions, I, I would really love to hear them. So it looks like I think I'm out of time and sorry if I went too fast. Let me, let me just say thanks to everybody who's worked on this project. It's been, all, all of these projects have been really great working with everyone that's listed here and it's been a lot of collaboration and I've learned a ton uh, working with Stacy. So I'll just say thank you and I will stop sharing my screen and can take questions. Thank you, Luke, very much. Like it was a very, very interesting talk and with a lot of information, a lot of data that you have worked. Um, so here we're we'll opening we are open for questions, so just turn on your microphone or just leave the questions on the, on the chat. Now, if there is any question for Luke. Luke, sorry, I, I can't make my video work. So, so Luke, there was one of those, so you showed, I can't, I should have said which slide it was, but there was the slide where you were doing your simulation or no. I can't remember, but there was something where you said one part of the pathway had been cut off completely going to delphinidin, but yet one of your pink little things was down in that pathway. Ah. Uh, what your slide? Yeah, so I guess, sorry, I was being a bit metaphorical. It, it, it hadn't okay, really so been- it wasn't, it wasn't actually cut off completely. It, it was, no, oh, it okay. hadn't, yeah, sorry, I can explain that a bit more. That's, uh, it, it wasn't uh, really cut off as so much. It was, it sort of dampened down Mm -hmm. strongly. Mm -hmm. So going from blue to purple, you kind of already make that branch pretty ineffective at doing what it otherwise would be doing. And so yeah. some of the mutations do do happen there still, but 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 for the most part, it's sort of dominated by mutations that are happening up in the, the, yeah. the branches that go from purple to red. Yeah. I just wondered if that one that was that mutation that was happening in that in the blue part of the pathway. Is that one that's also happening in the other in the other transition or is it something that's special to the kind of... Yes, it is red. something that's also happening in the blue transition. So it's sort of like a further dampening down of that, of the activity of that branch. 
if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, that does. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Any other question? Oh, yeah, we're hey, uh, This is Yao Yuan. Uh, oh, yeah. I really like your talk. Uh, I have one question and one comment. So the question is, uh, when you do those fed transcriptomic uh, analysis, uh, did you see any sort of signature of you know, hybridization or integration among those really close related species, or they are, the, you know, they are really clean? Um, that's a good question. I'm not actually sure. We're still, all of that's still pretty preliminary too. So we're, now that we will have three replicates from each species, I'm hoping we're gonna actually try to study that among other things. So we're looking at con like, you know, conflicts between gene trees and species trees across all of the orthologs we have represented and that kind of thing. And so hopefully we'll be able to infer that there are some pretty ambiguous relationships within the genera. So especially like if you looked, I, I didn't zoom in on Calibracoa that much, but you know that they're really closely related and I, I wouldn't be surprised if there is some, some hybridization going on with some of those. Okay, thanks. And the, <clears throat> the comment is about the third project. Um, when your level led down to, you know, a bunch of candidates, for example, you know, 60, 70, uh, you, you said it's a very small interval, right? How many genes really in that interval again? It, the total, or the ones that I was, at, that I actually picked up. The, the total? Like the, oh, the, total. Yeah, it's, it's um, hundreds that are in there. Yeah, so it's yeah. always a little bit. Uh, just my personal experience, it's dangerous to <laughs> pick up candidates like that because, you know, at least in my own experience, you know, 90% of the time I, I would be wrong. Like I would think, oh, yeah. this looks good, but it turns out to be wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, just, yeah, so like, like do you, you know, perhaps look through those, the, the gene list a little bit more just because, um, just because those genes are not neep, so it doesn't mean they can't regulate those F3 prime H. Uh, right. Because there, are, there are a lot of um, anthocyanin reprices that have been recovered in the past 10 years and they are not leaves at all. Interesting. Um, and those guys, people haven't really started much of those guys in natural evaluation yet just because those rapid reprices has, have only been discovered re more recently. Um, but they could be, they could be like, involved in um, regulation of anthocyanin in natural evaluation more often than we thought. Um, cool. And also because that that that, that brought a cotton leaf, I just don't really see how. I I I don't know any studies like showing that that brought a cotton leaf can regulate anthocyanins. Right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think I, if it is associated, I mean, like in the Stacy and Dan study, they found sort of a, a kind of an unexpected nib that acted as a as a repressor. Um, and so I well, you know I don't know these things are definitely evolving. Right, so that oh. NAMIB, at least people know, is related to subgroup of NAMIBs, and people have been known right. subgroup of NAMIBs that could regulate anthocyanins for a long time. So it's, it's, uh, it's not too surprising. I mean, it's, it's uh, interesting, but it's not too surprising, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I actually, my thought was that maybe the reason that I see so many things in that same region, that same narrow region, is that they're, that they're linked to the thing that's actually causing it. Yeah. Um, and there, like I, you, you, you're definitely right. There are other transcription factors in there. So there's some like uh, zinc finger transcription factors, and you know I don't know. Maybe maybe those have something to do with it. Or I kind of I actually went through that region and just looked at every single gene and picked out all the transcription factors. And then I specifically looked at their. I didn't I didn't go into this, but I looked at their expression too to see if any of them were doing something interesting. But there were a couple. There was a I think a GATA box transcription factor and a zinc finger transcription factor that I also picked up in the association uh, with associated variants. So yeah, maybe there's, maybe there's but, something else yeah, going on. Of course, on the other hand, if it is actually really caused by that, that brought a cotton leaf, that would be super interesting. Like super interesting because that would also potentially help to explain some of those pigmentation patterning because they, you know, they, there are a lot of flowers, mm. like that is the symmetrical flowers. They have you know, pigmentation patterns, you know, difference between the dorsal versus ventral patterns, right? And mm -hmm. that is involved in that. So if that can write you the ethosalians, that would be super cool. Yeah, agreed. Cool. Well, yeah, I appreciate your comments. I have a question. Yeah. If that's okay. Um, so I, back to the MIBs, I guess, since we're talking about MIBs, um, I had 
a, a question about your divericata finding. Um, so I think you mentioned that it was just uh, an H to a Q amino acid. Yeah, change. that's correct. Yep. Did you check to see where in the protein that occurred? Uh, yeah, I actually I can show you. I mean, it to the best of my ability, I made this homology model. Uh -huh. um, and let's see. So, so this is a homology model. The, the yellow is the homology model, and the blue is the template that I used to generate it. So the, this pink here is this, this histidine in the isenium sequence that would mm -hmm. be tra trans transitioning to a, to a glutamine. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's near, it's near the, the <coughs> DNA. It's, I mean, this whole thing is basically a DNA binding domain. So it's not like it's sticking, it's in this helix that's sticking down into the DNA, into the, the groove here. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't, I so don't let, know what that would be doing. Let me be a little more specific. <laughs> um, so I think that model is very cool. Um, I think I was thinking more about where the R2 domain is, where the R3 domain is, and then where the ah. BHLH interacting motif are. So this is not an R2, R3 MIB. It doesn't have that domain. So it's essentially it just a okay. single domain thing. Okay. And I don't know. Got it. <laughs> I mean, it has been shown to interact with, with, other, with other things, including things that aren't MIBs in like an antirhinum. Mm -hmm. I, this is all like, I've been doing this in the last, just like the last couple of weeks here. And so I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to learn a bunch of new things about what may, might be going on, but I don't want to get into like creating a narrative for myself and getting trapped in there. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I spent most of last summer doing that with Petunia. So um, <laughs> um, I just, I thought it was interesting because we've also found Divericata a couple of times in, mm. inside Petunia coming up, not necessarily in any compelling way yet, but I just thought it was really interesting that you found that interesting as well. Um, I have an unrelated phylogenetic question, if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I, hopefully I can answer it because the actual mechanics of the phylogenetic stuff is what Joe, Joe has been mainly doing that, so. Okay, no problem. It's just, um, do you guys have Petunia occidentalis in your data set? Just out of curiosity. Um, no, we do no. not. Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering, I would love to know where that is in the phylogeny. Such a weirdo. Yeah, I, I we wanted to, to, to have that one, but I, I just think none of us have been able to find it in, when on field trips, so. Yeah, um, I, I, think, like, I tried to collect it in Jujuy, but I couldn't find it because he wasn't in the flooring time. I was collecting the room. Oh. Um, also trying the Petunia occidentalis, but I, yes, I couldn't find it. That's why, I, yeah, don't have. Okay. Yeah, yeah. These trips well, are like we just go and we drive around and look look for things and look at our, where there are you know vouchers where things have been collected. And sometimes you're lucky, and other times we're not so lucky. <laughs> totally. Okay. Well, we have some if you want it. But oh, anyways, well, I was just really I was like, please, did you put it on the phylogeny? But okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. That's all. Great talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Well, let's see, it looks like a question. I think that there also, uh, Stacy was wanted to say something or I don't know if she's around or, okay, but Federico has also a question here in the chat. So he actually has two questions. I don't know if you want to turn on your microphone, Federico, or I should say. Okay, okay it's fine. Okay. Great talk, thanks. So I have two questions. The first is, if you found evidence or did you search for evidence of flower color genes being introgressed between taxa in, in your transcriptomic uh, phylogenomic studies? So that we are we are planning to do that. Yeah. So at the moment, what went into the what went into the uh, the tree is a single replicate from each species. And right now, I'm working on just finishing collecting this data set. So literally next week, I'm going to go to the lab and finish the libraries and have them sequenced, and then we'll have our full data set. We can start sort of diving into that stuff a little bit more. Sort of, yeah. All of this is real pretty new. So yeah, we're definitely planning on doing that. It's a good idea. And uh, and the next one, it's kind of methodological, and it's uh, what kind of software or methods are you using to find correlations between gene expression and and uh, anthocyanin content? Yeah, that's another good question. I actually, so th this is another thing where I don't even have all the data yet, so I'm 
<laughs> it's more like that's the plan. If you have any suggestions, I no I no no definitely... I, I am also planning to do the same. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I definitely. We don't have need... the data yet. Yeah, we need a, a, a you know a phylogenetic comparative uh, approach. I think to do it, and um, I mean there are there are some tools I was looking at that are. Um, I, I, I can email you if, and just send you the things that I have so far seen, but I, I don't, I don't really know. And I wouldn't pretend to be a ex expert on this. So. <laughs> okay. That would be great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Federico. There is also another question of Evan McCoy. Do you want to turn on your microphone? Or? Yeah, sure. Um, this was probably the most exciting talk I've seen in a long time. Um, I work with tannins and beans. So I look at these different pathways a lot. And I haven't heard someone present on them before, so I was really excited. Um, have you looked at the purple to blue transition? Um, and specifically why is because F3 prime, 5 prime H isn't present in all plants. Um, for example, Arabidopsis doesn't have a copy of it, so it can't make delphinidins. So I was, I, and with my work, I'm kind of interested in how that would look, like the switch uh -huh. over from adding this enzyme. And, and there's not a really good system. Honestly, not a lot of people talk about delphinidins because um, they're not in a lot of models. So I think T, people talk about them a lot, but this is one of the few times that I could find someone interested in that. So uh -huh. I wondered if you had looked at that one specifically. Yeah, I, you know, I haven't. I mean, I looked at the reverse, which was the blue to purple, and you see that yeah. effectively the things that you're talking about are effectively lost or they're dampened down. Um, it would be easy to do the reverse um, in, in my model. The, the thing that maybe you might want to do is um, sort of completely nullify those branches. So basically make them, the, the, I, I don't really have a way of like changing the topology during the evolutionary simulation, but you can sort of make a proxy for that by setting all of the parameters for those things to zero. So essentially it's a dead branch and then you could, yeah. you could watch it reacquire <laughs> the function. My guess would be starting from zero like that, you'd probably, you'd kind of get a, you'd have a longer, the average trajectories would be longer as it's trying to claw its way back or it would involve really big <laughs> initial jumps in the acquisition of like reacquiring F3 prime, five prime age activity, for example, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that at some point. Yeah, if you sure. Want. Like, yeah, I'd love to. Um, the other thing, I think F3 prime, 5 prime age might be able to act without F3 prime age. I'm not uh, yeah. sure about that, though. Um, That's true. Yeah. It varies from, spe from species to species, and in okay. some cases it seems like it's a pretty weak secondary activity, but they are somewhat redundant. And I didn't incorporate that in my model. But but I you I could it it would be easy to do that too. Um, the I think it would again it would sort of forestall. You'd have to change both things, or you'd have to you might be able yeah. to sort of see you might yeah. see sort of a partitioning of like a that makes sense. Things. Yeah, like yeah. division of labor across the two things. But it's an interesting gene. Like in soybean, there's only two copies of it. So like F3 primate, there's a ton. I don't know how many there are even, um, and all the other genes in there. But F3 primate in the in the reference. There's only two copies, so you see like this kind of reduced copy number, and it it I don't know. I just found it pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd, yeah. If you ever, I'd love to chat about it sometime if you yeah. want to have a talk yeah, about that. Yeah, of course. Cool. But I just I love the talk. I it was amazing. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Ivan. Um, yeah. Thank you, Luke. If there is another question, we have like. Okay, for one last, if there is any other. Okay, I guess I'll ask my question because all this, this is really exciting. Luke, I hadn't seen how far you've gotten with the, you know, the narrowing down the possible candidate genes and that was really neat. And personally, like, we don't know what it's going to be, you know, after seeing Andrea's talk this summer where Amib was recruited to anthocyanin regulation in a new way, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was divericot, it could be anything or it could be not Amib. So I'm wondering about how we narrow that down, kind of like yeah, we were saying. I guess I have two two possibilities. I wonder which one you think would be most tractable or useful. One is that as you go away from the causative locus, we should see sort of recombination breaking away the association. And do you see that pattern? Like, can we can, can we see any of that degrade, uh, degradation? And I guess my second question is, I wonder about a co-expression analysis. So of all the candidate genes in that region. I wonder if we could do a co-expression and see which ones talk to flavanols at all 
because we had all these transcriptomes. Because presumably the gene, kind of like in Andrea's case, already talk, already kind of knows how to talk to flavonoids, and thus maybe it's more likely to be recruited in the first place. Those are my two thoughts. Yeah, I, I mean, I think those are both. I think those both would be good things to do. I definitely, I think that the first thing you said might be a little bit easier. Although it'd be easiest if we if we could use our the isineum genome, you know, like if we have have that and have it. Um, we know what where these things go. We could just look at how the reads that map to those things stack up on there and see. Yeah, because I think I think I would expect the same thing. You see, sort of a normal distribution of read density that tapers away as you go farther in either direction from from this thing, right? And um, yeah, so that would be doable. And then yeah, I think the co-expression thing would be cool too because that would give us a second piece of information about what's going on in the regulatory space. I think it's cool that we have. We have the we have both the sequence space and the regulatory space, and we can look at both in the exact same data set. It's actually pretty handy. If that answers your question. Yes, it's very good. Okay. So well, thank you very much, Luke. Yes, an amazing talk, and thank you everyone for coming. So um here we're finishing the, the seminar, but we are, um, well, we are waiting you next week, next Friday for the next seminar of Rebecca Hilgenroth um, and the Solenum Key for this entire like group that is big, big genius. So see you next Friday. Um, well, thank you.